I'm going to start. Thank you so much for joining in today. Whether you have joined us live on a repeat or uh, in a featured video, I'm glad you tune in. Uh, my name is Amber Jamshed, and today we, go, we are going to talk about the reflection we see in the mirror as American, and specifically uh, the reflection of South Asians living in America. Before I jump into introducing my featured guest with you, I want to tell you that all professional women communities like HBWO and DPWO stand in solidarity and support for equality alongside with our black brothers and sisters. It is no doubt that uh, we all have felt the unrest of the nation and we all wanting to be part of the solution. My hope is that this, this um, commitment of yours towards equality will become um, like will become uh, uh, give me one second. My equality becomes a lifelong purpose, like it is ours. And while being part of this conversation, you make an additional commitment towards um, in, to embed diversity, inclusion, and equity efforts, along with the action to bring reform to our local levels and nation. Listen, it is no denying that America is looking itself into the mirror. And the, the reflection we see, we are not happy with that. Injustice, lack of accessibility, police brutality, and um, all that discrimination, career obstacles, these are just examples of some of the systemic racism that America is facing. This is the first time in history that all America, along with the world, is standing together. And they are all together is protesting against this. And, we being Americans, you know, we have to face this and we have to solve this problem. Um, it is obvious that our nation has a lot of healing to do. And our hope is that today's segment challenges you to take inventory of your thoughts, feelings, and experiences and focus on how you can be an LA to combat inequality and injustice. Thank you for allowing me to facilitate this conversation. My hope is that today's um, segment will challenge you to take inventory of your thoughts, feelings, and experiences, and focus how you can be an ally to combat inequality and injustice. Um, I would like to introduce my featured uh, and honorable guest to you. Uh, I have Ms. Sada with me. She is a scholar of religion, literature, and politics. She is um, a human and women rights activist and mayor of Montgomery Township, New Jersey. Um, Mayor Joffer has attracted um, national attention since taking office in 2019 and as a first female Muslim mayor in American history. Welcome on the panel. And then Thank I have so an, and then I have an other amazing guest on my panel. Everyone know him. Um, in Houston, Dr. Shah. Welcome, Dr. Shah. Dr. Shah holds the Barbara and Carbon J. Robertson uh, Jr. Chair in Psychiatry and is Executive Vice Chair and Professor of Psychiatry at Baylor College of Medicine, Houston, Texas. He's currently Chair for Mental Health American Houston, America, Houston. Welcome, both of you. Thank you for joining us for this session with um, uh, Inside Take with Amber. How are you guys doing? Doing well. How are you? I'm good. Thank, thank you so much for giving me your time. My pleasure. Thanks for having us. First of all, I will start um, with, my, with my first question with Dr. Shah. There is a, a cure for racism. The deep wounds can be healed, but the healing process is intricate, deliberate, and will require involvement from, the, uh, from those who have previously remained silent. What is your opinion on that? So, um, yeah, racism can be cured, but the, the biggest problem with racism is that we at times don't understand why there is racism. And we kind of uh, confuse racism between prejudice. They both are bad, by the way. Right. Um, racism usually starts with uh, lack of identity and starts because people have a fear that somebody is going to take something from them. So there is a fear that I may lose a job because of A, B, and C, or some other would get a preference, and that's how the racism starts. So we not only need to acknowledge that racism and the causes of racism, which could be the fear of uh, 
losing things and in some ways inferiority uh, uh, complex that you're gonna lose something. And once we realize, then we need to omit the biases and then we can treat it. Treating meaning heal it. The, the other thing to remember about racism is that a lot of us uh, talk about racism, but not knowing necessarily what is racism. There are so many systematic racism or racist thing which happen in the society, in the community, whether it is your work environment, whether it is your school. Look at the fact that when our kids go to school, what are they called? They are called brown. So that's a, another prejudice or racism in many senses. So racism starts from home, from school, from work. And unless and until we take care of all aspects of that, we cannot cure racism. So it has to be a, a multifactorial effort uh, within society, within people, within our cultures, uh, schools, workplace, and home and everywhere. So we have to do all of that. that that's, that's right. And especially, I think we have to speak about it. It's like, you know, when we don't speak so we have to tell that this this is going on and we have to raise our voices against it then people will know that there is a problem and we need to solve the problem in order to solve any problem the first uh, concept is recognition of the problem exactly. if we don't even know there is a problem how can we even do anything about it so you're right we need to recognize um, racism not only that we need to speak about it and we need to be truthful about it and again in our cultures that's what you you mentioned it starts from home that we need to teach our family our kids like at the dining table, at the dinner table, that these are not things which are likable, which we shouldn't be tolerating, we shouldn't be doing that. And then a lot of systematic uh, bullying happens because of racism, and we can talk about that later. Yeah, right, right. Okay, my next question is with uh, Ms. Sadaf. Um, there is, um, as South Asians, how can we help combat this, uh, systemic racism in America? Thank you for that question. I think that the first thing that we have to realize is that racism hurts everyone. That's true. A system that has, creates a hierarchy and puts some people above others is hurtful to everyone. And it's, it's hurtful to us too. Um, and also I think it's important for us to, to, to acknowledge that many of the rights, all the rights that we have in this country are because of the act activism of the black community in America, yes. that, you know, there was a very strict immigration system in which Asians were not allowed to migrate to the U.S. and they were not allowed to become citizens. And it was because of the civil rights movement that, that was changed in the 1950s. So Asians were not allowed to migrate to the U.S. and they were not allowed to become citizens because of the civil rights movement that was I think maybe if, to mute, if you mute your video, that would probably help. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Um, so I think that um, we have to acknowledge what we have gained from the activism of other communities. And many of us, you know, who are immigrants, first, second, third generation immigrants, we have to understand the history of this country, that we kind of became a part of it very recently. And there is a long history there. There's 400 years of history in terms of um, slavery and the wealth that was created in this country that we all benefit from that black Americans have never been paid back for. You know, it was built on their labor. All of the wealth of this country was built on their labor and they've been systematically and systemically denied access to the benefits of that wealth. So we, we have to understand that wittingly or unwittingly, we are part of a very problematic system. And so once we acknowledge that, then we can start doing things to um, work in solidarity with people, try to spread opportunity, um, not think of ourselves as, not fall into that trap of seeing ourselves as the model minority, because that was created as a way to pit Asian Americans, including South Asians, against Black Americans and Hispanic Americans, that Asians are somehow you know, superior or something. And, that's not, there's nothing inherent in any race that makes them in, inferior or superior. It's just, um, we're all equal. We all deserve equal rights, but unfortunately we don't all start off with the same opportunities and we need to equalize opportunity in this country for everyone. Yeah, that, that's very true because once the opportunities are equal, then I think everyone can enjoy the same kind of rights and uh, they can have the same kind of uh, 
opportunities, um, they can um, enjoy that. So my next question is uh, with Dr. Cha. Um, how can we combat the stigmas of our community regarding colorism and caste system values that, um, that we are in America? We still are, yeah. I think we are still in the same era, you know, that we still have the same stigma. So what do you think? How should we, uh, where, from where should we start actually to change that? Yeah, again, I'll go back to the same thing. We need to start from home because what is happening is that we have moved to this great country and uh, some of us, not all of us, but some of us are still stuck to the same prejudice which we even had in our own country of origin, whether it is Pakistan or India or so forth. So we have still those prejudices, whether you are from that province or this province or this caste or that caste. And all of that makes racism even more uh, difficult to treat. So if we delete that uh, prejudice from our own self, and if we first take the first step at home, we can certainly take uh, care of this racism, um, which is in our society. So for example, what we need to do is our religion teaches us that we need, we are all the same. We are all one and there is no caste system. There is no uh, ethnicity or anything like that. We are all the same. When will we start believing that? When will we start believing that a person from this province is better or worse than the person from other province? When will we believe that this regional language is better than the other regional language? When will we believe in uh, the caste system that it doesn't exist? When will we believe that Sayyids can marry non-Sayyids and all those things? So if we start this from home, we can uh, talk about racism at a bigger scale because what kids see at home, that's how it goes further. Who is the role model for kids? Parents. If they're not going to see it in their parents, it is going to go on and on and they will see that. And other thing, uh, you may or may not have seen this, uh, that um, one of the West Indian cricketer who was in India, he, uh, I think it was Darren Sammy, he said that when he was in India, everybody was calling him Kalia. Kalia. Yeah. That is an issue. And he realized now after five years, because they use those terms, um, I think Aziz Warsi or Aziz Ahmed used that term in a, in a, a comedy thing. Uh, but these are simple examples of racism. We do it at home, calling them Kala or Kalia. We shouldn't be doing that because th this is how we can end racism if we keep everything equal, if we don't even use those slangs and slurs at home. And I think Dr. Shah, you will agree with me at this point that our, it's mostly in our generation the new generation our kids are probably they even even we speak a little small word like kala or kalia they they right away tell mommy or daddy this is not the right way to uh, say or this not to call anyone you know they i feel them they are in much better position than us what do you think, if you think about it it is a generational thing absolutely people who were born before uh, the 1960s have more racism in them more than likely than people who were born in the 60s perhaps me or so and then the new generation who were born in the 90s usually don't have that why because their peers uh, they talk about it they talk about the rights more all those things you don't see them in them but you see it otherwise and those are the reasons that racism continues but what do we learn from our teenagers? We need to learn this from our teenagers that these values, which they are portraying to us, we need to adopt also. Because again, exactly. even if we don't want to adopt it for any other reason, we can adopt it for our, uh, for our religion. Religion teaches the same thing. Uh, why did we move to America? We moved to America because of this same reason that this is a country of immigrants and this country respects all religions, all cultures, all ethnicities, and everybody from anywhere. So the sole thing that we are in america should tell us that we should be completely against racism yeah that's true so i think the point is that we i think this our generation needs to be focusing more on this point that we need to step back and learn few things that our that the, our kids are already practicing i think in their school they don't care like it's from which um, race the kids are they just mingle and mix they just play with them and then they are they that just treat them equally i think and which is really great i really appreciate this thing in my kids or i think all of the kids are here they they have the same kind of uh, thing so let's move to the next question we have uh, for miss um, sadaf many times uh, we see communities like um, south asian community that stay in neutral time of um, during time of divide what message do you have for them like when there is any problem we just stay we don't say anything and we don't even negate anything, but we just stay there. Um, oh, 
what action should be at that time that we really need to take a step at that time? What do you think? Well, um, you always have to stand up. Inaction is the same as saying that what's happening is okay. And but so you have probably seen good. that the South Asian communities, they probably think, I think, twice or many times before they speak anything because they think that we are in America and we need to um, think twice before uh, saying anything that gonna affect our immigration or our stand or anything right. like that. You think that, you think, do you agree with me at this point? Well, I mean, I think it's good to be thoughtful. I don't think that it's, it's good to just react right away because you also see people who react right away saying like, who are these people destroying things and why are they destroying stores and blah, blah, blah. So it's always, it's, always, it's always better to just think a little bit, do some research into what's going on. But I think that our community is becoming more educated on the history of racism yeah. that the black community has faced why it is that they've been systemically denied opportunities. Why is it that there is such a wealth gap? I mean, I think that the studies have shown that the average wealth of a white family is $170,000 or $117,000, and the black family is $17,000. So think about that, 10 times more wealth. So how can you even think that they're gonna have equal opportunities in this country? So we have to educate ourselves. Um, I, and then, I mean, I would advocate definitely standing in solidarity with the black community. I think it's, it's always important to stand for those people who are being oppressed, no, no matter where they are, whether it's in the U.S., it's in another country, it's in our home countries. Um, it's basically standing for the human rights. It right, exactly. Standing for justice and the right thing and, and equality is always important. I, want, I would like to have uh, Mr. Shah's comment on this. Uh, yeah. Just to add on that, um, we have to first also realize why our communities don't talk about social exactly, injustice. Exactly, exactly. And the reason for that a lot of time is, that, like you said yourself, some of them are scared of their immigrant status, some of them right. are already bullied that if they do A, B, and C, their status can be in jeopardy. Right. So not only we need to talk about the social injustice, but we need to also talk about this racial bullying, which happens a lot. This is a common phenomenon, which happens a lot that if somebody is immigrant, somebody may uh, bully them based on their immigrant status. We need to talk about all kinds of injustices, whether it is social injustice, whether it is bullying because of that. And we need to stand with everybody and anybody who has been victimized. Uh, in, in right now, we're talking um, uh, blacks, uh, but even if it happens to any other um, ethnicity or any other, we need to. Why? Because if we don't step up, nobody if we are in need, nobody is going to step up. And that's that's, that's what, how I take it, you know. If I'm hurt and nobody can feel the pain, I, I, I can assume the same. Like, if I'm not feeling the pain or other, nobody can feel my pain. So yes. it's like being human, being sensitive to the issues and being uh, vocal to the issues sometimes. We have to speak, we have to raise voice so other people can listen, other people can join us with this. So that's why, especially if you look at the situation right now in the country, I think this is the right time. We have to speak, everyone has to speak and it's, it's against humanity, whatever was done. It is not related to any religion, anything, but strictly uh, related to the humanity. So violation of the humanity, so human rights. So let's move to an, uh, our next question that gonna be with um, Mr. Shah. How hate and racism impacting us psychologically? I think that I would like to ask Mr. Shah. Yeah. So if you think about um, <clears throat> racism, racism is truly a psychological trait. Um, it is sort of a defense mechanism, mechanism for people who feel insecure, for people who feel anxiety. Uh, and it can take many forms, but truly, if you think about it, it starts as a psychological trait because of insecurity, because of anxieties. Now, if you dissect that further, you can certainly look into why people are insecure, why there is this anxiety that somebody is going to steal things from them. There is a feeling that, oh, if there is a certain amount of food on the table, and if I don't divide, separate based on, based on this uh, racial uh, theme, I may not get enough. Our goal should be to tell everybody, everybody would get enough. Why? Because there is enough food on the table and that's what we need to delete. So it is psychological, yes, but it impacts people psychologically tremendously. 
So how does it impact people psychologically tremendously? So if you are a victim of uh, racism, and if you see this happening, what will happen to people is they will develop PTSD, they will develop depression, they will develop uh, hatred towards other people. That's how the hate crimes and other things start also. So we have to stop that at the beginning. And the beginning is from, we would discuss the, few, the numerous ways. Uh, we have to stop that at the beginning. Now, if we see somebody is exhibiting some sort of racism, what do we need to do? So we can do a lot of things. Um, we can, first of all, it is never a good idea to, to confront that person at that particular point. We need to react calmly. We need to be kind with that person at that particular point, and maybe not even talk to that person at that time. If you feel that it is going to the point that you need to call the police, maybe uh, you need to document things. You need to control your in initial emotions. We know that the first emotions, initial emo emotions are usually not the right ones. So we need to control that. Um, again, not react at that time and try to educate. And if you feel you cannot educate, maybe a neutral person can educate. That is the reason these days in every institution, every school, uh, and a lot of organizations, they're talking about cultural diversity, they're talking about racism, they're talking about social injustice. These are the classes which needs to be done almost every year because people tend to forget. And if we don't listen to that, we cannot take care of that. Yeah, and I think it's a constant reminder, you know, that we have to fight against. It's like you constantly should be going into the minds to um, combat this one. Okay, let's move to the other question. That's going to be uh, for Ms. Sadow. Can you talk about the American dream, what it means to you, and how we can work towards the, this value for all Americans? Well, I think that the American dream, it's an aspiration that people can live their lives the way that they choose, that they can accomplish things if they put their mind to it. And those values are very important. I think it's also important to acknowledge that the dream has not been fulfilled, has not been really available to everyone. Um, and so it's something to work towards. I think it's very important to have goals and ideals. I get worried when people say, well, it, it doesn't exist it's never gonna exist and it never has existed because I think that we need something to work towards and I think it's a worthy goal. Um, and we've seen successively things getting better in this country. I mean, if you think about it, there really was no reason to abolish slavery. I mean, people were making so much money off of the labor of their slaves in this country, but eventually we did ab abolish slavery because of the efforts and the work of so many people. And um, you know the civil rights movement, as I said, people from Asia could not come to this country very easily and they couldn't become citizens. And now we can, you know, so many of us are and are in different roles, even in elected office, for example. So uh, I think it's about the spreading, making the playing field more equal, allowing opportunity to people. But I also think that we need to think beyond America. What, what are our policies doing in other countries? Are we really allowing people to live out their dreams in other countries? Or is it that we're just constantly only worrying about benefits for ourselves? Mm -hmm. So um, this is why you, know, you see protests against anti-Black racism happening all over the world, even where they don't have Black populations very much. Yeah, so, I think this is the first time that everyone is together, everyone is yes. happy against this. And now is the time they realize that if we really want to abolish this, if we really want to get rid of this, we have to stand together in solidarity. Yes. So that it was just that group of people who, who were into the protest, like from only that race. But now you have seen South Asians, all, all from all races, people were together. Even I think this was, um, I was really surprised this in this situation when there is a COVID-19 and still you see in Houston, there were like 60K people in the protest. This, this is like, you know, you can't imagine the people were not scared of their life. The people were not scared of the disease. They were there to support those uh, people, you know, and which is, which is amazing. I think this is all because of the education. This is all because of the, um, the social media as well. I will give credit to that too, you know, because people see that when, whenever there is need to be happened, they have to speak and they have to raise their voices if they, they really need to change that thing. So I want uh, your point too, Mr. Shaw, on this question, like the values and being American, you know, uh, uh, you can add something to it too, please. Um, I think Sadaf said uh, everything which is right. Um, 
So, of course, American dream is a dream of prosperity. It is a dream of equality. It is a dream of respect with each other. And it is the dream that there is no prejudice and there is no racism, actually. That is the American dream. Why do we move to this country? This is the greatest country in the world. We move to this country because we want equality. We like equality. We like prosperity. We like our dreams to be met yeah, without, without any hindrances. So that is it. And, and uh, Mayor Sadaf raised a very good point that while we, we propagate uh, equality, social justice, and talk about social injustice in this country, how can we forget about social injustice anywhere else in the world? Social injustice uh, in America is the same as social injustice in any other country. I don't want to name any country, but there are so many countries where it is happening. So if we feel that social injustice is wrong, then we need to talk about social injustice everywhere in the world. We cannot just limit it to New York or New Jersey or Texas or, or America or Canada. It has to be everywhere. And that is something which sometimes, and I'm not going to go into politics because I'm not a politician, but that is something, perhaps she can say more openly than not, but that is something we feel sometimes America has missed because we talk about social injustice in our country, maybe not necessarily all over the world or selected parts of the world, but that's a separate debate. That's not a debate. That, that's, that's a very important issue, I think, but this could be the first step to raising our voices and then people can see that wherever it is happening around the world, it should be treated equally. It's not like if it's happening in America that we should stand, but if even it's happening in Kashmir or any other places, you know, we need to, and our community, I think, this is uh, one big thing for them too, to think about that if this, these races can stood out, why we can't be united and why we can't be, we can raise our voices against the injustice and the violation of human rights, which is going on on the Muslims <clears throat> and on the other people, you know, around the world. So the next um, thing I would like to, um, we have a lot of um, um, young leaders and um, um, students with us in this organization. So I would like, if you want to add up something for them, um, your points for, for them, you know, please do uh, go ahead and share your thoughts for them, for them for the young professionals and for the youth, any special message for them? I, I need an answer for both from both of yeah. Go ahead. Um, you need to start or you want to start? I'll go ahead. Sure. Um, so I would say that I think that one of the most important things, there, I think that there's a balance between only caring about your own life and not thinking about all the injustice out there. I think that that's wrong because you're ignoring the fact that by, by refusing to participate, you're actually allowing injustice to continue. So that, I think you need to step out of your own lives and, and make sure that you are trying to work to help other people. But I also think that sometimes when people get very passionate and they get very involved, then they become cynical. And they're like, everything is terrible. Society's never gonna get better. And uh, politics is all horrible. And I'm just gonna disengage. So I would say, don't be, so optimistic that you don't think there's anything wrong, but also don't be so pessimistic that you become cynical. And, um, you know, I can say as an elected official that there are a lot of uh, good elected officials out there who are trying to do the right thing. There are a lot of ways to get involved. You can accomplish a lot in our democratic system. Exactly. Um, and you need to hold your elected officials accountable to representing your values and your goals. So if you have things happening in your city or in your county or your state or your country that you don't like, that's not in line with your values, you should call up your elected officials and you should say, I don't think this is right. You need to do something different. You should make appointments with them. Um, you know, I, I went to a seminar, I was participating in a program at ISNA and they said that you know, um, American Muslims are some of the least, they make the least demands of their elected officials. They just, they don't even call them and say, hey, this is wrong. I don't like this. Why are you doing this? This is, don't do this in my name. So that's the very first step. I mean, complaining and talking and whatever on social media is fine. That is educational. It's good. But if you really want to make a difference, I would say start calling your elected officials, make appointments with them, tell them what you believe, and then, you know, start supporting candidates who have the same values as you and even think about running yourself because then you can make those decisions based on your values, based on what's right, based on spreading opportunity and equality to everyone. So that's, that's what I would say. Yeah, I totally agree that that's right. I would agree to everything uh, Mir Sadaf said, but I would add that 
not only what she said is absolutely we need to do, but the basic thing, why do we don't vote? Why do we not vote? We all need to go out and vote. We all need to volunteer. Mm -hmm. Our population, if you talk about the South Asians and teenagers, how much do we volunteer? We don't. We need to volunteer more. We need to vote more. Also, as a teenager, as a young population, we can stop bullying. We would see uh, systemic bullying uh, in the schools and colleges. We see it everywhere. Examples of that is you see somebody calling a racist name and we not stop them if it's your friend. You see somebody insulting somebody. I, I gave some examples earlier. Why cannot we stop it? You see somebody damaging or writing a racial graffiti. Can you not stop it? Um, we see people being treated differently based on the race. Why cannot we stop it? At least talk to our family, our friends. There are ways, things we can do uh, which will impact. We sometimes laugh on racist jokes. Why do we do that? That's also supporting racism. So we don't need to do that. So if we walk away when somebody is doing any of these things, this is gonna stop racism also. Even if you see your coach or your teacher or somebody doing that, if you cannot complain about that or do anything, at least you need to walk away so that it is not supported. We need to do these things while being safe. Again, the purpose is not to confront people, but we should stand up. And sometimes even quietly standing up is better than not standing up. That's true, because I think when we don't speak, it shows that we are agreeing to that point. That shows that you have implied consent and you are agreeing to what is being said. So we need to at least quietly stand up and register a quiet protest, if not anything else. That's true. That's true. And the, I like that point you said that even if we can't do anything, at least walk away from the situation to tell them that you don't, you didn't like that one, whatever was shared or whatever was said. So this is a very important point, you know, I like, it. especially sometimes you are in a situation, you can't do anything, you can't raise your voice, you cannot do anything, but at least uh, you just can walk away. So that will show that you didn't like the thing and you are not supporting that action, you know. And there is one last question that is left that for first generation Americans that, uh, that have not established their voting rights, like non-citizens, what they can do to help combat system, uh, uh, sy uh, systemic racism. Ms. Adav, you can go ahead, please. I would say, um, you know, you can join different organizations that are doing education. I think, frankly, we need a lot of education within our immigrant community about American history and the complexity of it and the, the systemic racism that exists. So volunteer within your community to do educational programs. You can always campaign for people, what, no matter what your, uh, whether you're a citizen or not, you can help candidates get elected, even if you yourself cannot run for office or vote. Um, and I would say just be, be, an, be an upstander, right? Like don't be a bystander. If you hear something wrong, if you see something being done that's wrong, stop and say, this is not okay. You need to, you need to change your behavior. Um, you need to stop speaking in this racist manner. Um, so I think, and then think about making financial contributions to help support the black community. Yeah, Specifically, if it's about anti-black racism, whether they're scholarship funds, whether they are funds to help with housing, you should support things like affordable housing initiatives and um, you know, fair schooling and funding for schools all throughout the states um, that is not just based on property taxes. I mean, there's so many different ways in which wealthy Americans are separated from poorer Americans and that oftentimes maps all along to race. So I recently participated in an event at, in Newark, New Jersey uh, for Black Lives Matter that was organized by the Muslim community. And um, a lot of the black speakers were saying, it's, it's good to see lots of members of the immigrant Muslim community here. What we need from you is to invest in our community. You know, make sure that you are giving us, the, like supporting our businesses, supporting our initiatives, supporting scholarship funds and all of that stuff. Um, and frankly, you know, things like affirmative action that a lot of Asian Americans say like, oh, it's unfair that there are policies in place to try to help black Americans and Hispanic Americans get into educational uh, institutions. And that is another one of those times when people pit the Asian American community against the black and Hispanic communities. And we need to say, no, this is all a process of trying to make everything more just and fair. And that's good for everyone. So I, I mean, I think those are some, those are tough things 
tough pills for some of us to swallow. Um, and I think getting over that narrative that, oh, if we could do it, why can't they do it? It's because there's a whole other history of trauma and systemic racism that they face that we don't face. So we need to acknowledge even how privileged we are. I think that that's definitely something that we need to do. Thank you so much. And Dr. Shah, would you like to add anything to sure. your question? I think we need to do a few things um, uh, in that. First is we, we have to recognize the biases. I mean, we know that biases exist, some known, some implicit, some without. We need to know that. So we have to recognize that, number one. There's no option not to recognize that. Then we need to talk about diversity. We need to talk about social injustices. We need to talk about why it is important because we have ignored discussion about diversity. We have ignored discussion about social injustice for a long time. It's no option anymore. That is not an option anymore. Then we have to respect all the religions, all the cultures ongoing because if we don't respect, what is our what are our peers and families and friends going to see? So we have to do that because it starts from home. Everything starts from home. Also, what we need to do is uh, we need to commit ourselves to change. So what can we, how can we commit ourselves to change? So for example, if there is a protest and we go ourselves, that is committing ourselves not only to change, but, but to participate in change. So we need to do all those things. And lastly, I would also like to mention something for the viewers, which is basically what we call it as eight hours of uh, racism. And uh, we need to talk about the eight hours of racism, which is extremely important. So the first is respect. Of course, respect is very needed. Second is reflect. Third is uh, uh, resign. Um, so respect, reflect, resign, and then research and relearn, uh, and then reset and reboot. So if we do all these eight hours of uh, racism, which is uh, uh, you know uh, <clears throat> important, like respect, reflect, resign, uh, research, relearn, uh, reset and reboot, we can make a difference and we can change. That's true. Thank you so much. So at the end, I would like to thank you both for uh, your time and for your um, uh, informative session, you know, and I will sum up with Dr. Martin Luther um, King Jr. Um, quote that the time is always right to do right. Racism and hate hurts everyone. It's not just us. And the point is when racism raises its ugly head and the silence become toxic. And it's, it's and our empathy um, and our silence is like interpreted to total acceptance. And to conclude our session, uh, 